I will be talking about the assumptions which are uh, made in conventional geomechanics for dealing with several problems. The first assumption is that we assume uh, the seepage velocity remains constant. Do you contest this or you accept? What is your opinion? The seepage velocity remains constant or not? Remember in the previous lecture we have talked about the void ratio and the porosity does not remain constant. So, when these two are the facts then seepage velocity cannot remain constant. Why? Sir, seepage velocity is dependent on the void, void ratio, it is dependent on the void from the in the plane. Between. Directly proportional or inversely proportional? It is 1 by n. Yes, what is 1 by n? N is the void ratio. Seepage velocity is 1 by n times of what? Uh, the velocity is like a uh, vertical. The flow is uh, taking place to the whole area. So, you consider there must be some technical name discharge velocity. So, discharge velocity divided by porosity is the seepage velocity. The seepage velocity is always higher than discharge velocity. So, basically, this assumption that seepage velocity remains constant is not correct. Why? Because the porosity itself is getting changed. So, a minor change in the porosity would result in affected seepage velocity. Now, there are two scenarios one is the porosity may decrease because of the flow occurring in the voids and the second situation could be porosity may increase under what circumstances this might happen. Now, upward downward has no meaning it does not matter whether it is upward or downward or inclined it makes no sense yes. This is how in the books they draw a figure is it not upward or downward truly speaking it does not matter against gravity or in the direction of the gravity are the two things yes. Very good. So, whenever you have suspended particles in the fluid uh, the choking of the pores may occur that is right. In that case what will happen when see he is talking about the uh, sub, sub zero temperature state of the material. So, because of the frost formation what will happen to the total volume? So, what will happen to the porosity? Total volume. So, what happens to the total volume when some system uh, gets frozen? Expansion mostly. So, because of expansion the void ratio will become less that is one situation and what you are saying is there are suspended particles which may settle down. Yes, any other situation apart from this? And your wastewater and all when you deal with wastewater percolating through the porous system. The chemicals may precipitate themselves depending upon the pH of the solution. So, there could be a precipitation of metal corresponding to a certain pH value. Now, if precipitate occurs within the pore system what happens to the porosity it will again change. We have been talking about the situation where the fines from the porous system may migrate because of contamination in water, acid rains. So, acid rains are a good example of how rain water at high at high acidity that means low pH interacts with the porous media eats up all the cementitious material which is binding the particles together and then what will happen the finer fraction of the soil mass or the porous media gets washed out. So, here the porosity will increase fine. So, that means the biggest culprit on which the seepage depends would be the pH and chemical species which are present in the geo environment and the way they are interacting with the porous media. I have been giving you a lot of examples that like organic soils may get eaten up by uh, low pH uh, water acidulated water we call it. So, because of the percolation of the acidulated water through porous media the entire soil mass itself may get consumed fine. So, here you cannot define V V and V as such because both V V and V are functions of time and concentration of the chemicals which are present in the geo environment. So, this equation becomes very complicated that means porosity itself becomes a function of time 
you might not have solved these problems until now, is it not? Where the porosity itself becomes a function of time, hydraulic conductivity becomes a function of time. Are you realizing these things? So, I cannot use the term V equal to K into I because the discharge velocity which is proportional to hydraulic coefficient or coefficient of permeability multiplied by hydraulic gradient itself becomes a function of time, fine. So, these are the situations which may occur and hence the uh, we cannot assume seepage velocity to remain constant. Have you heard about coupled phenomena? So, he was talking about coupled phenomena which occurs in the porous system is it not. So, because of the coupled phenomena also the porous media gets affected which normally we do not consider in our conventional geomechanics. A simple example of uh, coupled phenomena would be the soil mass gets heated up, simple desiccation also very close to the surface because of the solar energy or the sun energy the top surface of the soil getting heated up. Now, when it gets heated up the moisture front moves in the opposite direction of the thermal gradient fine in which the heat is migrating. So, it is a situation where the heat is migrating from one point to another point and because of heat the moisture itself migrates either in the same direction or in the opposite uh, other direction also. A better way of explaining this would be so, suppose if I take a control volume of soil and I heat it from the top Q is the flux. Now, because of this what is going to happen the heat front is moving downwards. So, I am using theta as the heat front and because of this the moisture is changing. Now, moisture migration could be in two directions it could be in this direction or it could be in this direction. Can you describe these two situations? Under what circumstances the moisture migration would be in the opposite direction to the flux and in the same direction to the flux? When the water will evaporate from the top of the surface, uh, there will be a capillary action take place. Very good. Excellent. So, he is correct. Now, in this direction the movement of moisture would be when evaporation is occurring from the free surface fine. So, here the two fluxes are antagonizing each other you got the point the flux migrates from let us say point number 1 to 2 this is point number 1 this is point number 2. So, flux migration is from 1 to 2 the moisture migration is from 2 to 1 very rightly you said it could be because of capillary action. So, the tendency of the capillary action or the capillarity which gets generated in the material is to lift or to let the void saturate, remain saturated. So, this condition is valid when we are dealing with clays. Now, if I change the material what is going to happen and if I say this is granular material coarse sands then what will happen? What will the direction of movement of the moisture? See this flux of the energy gets added to the gravity and because of that the chances are that the moisture may migrate from 1 to 2 direction itself. So, in this case where the system is highly porous the migration of the moisture would be in the direction of the heat flux. So, this type of situation when it occurs we call this as a coupled phenomena. And if I add something to this in the terms of chemicals let us say these chemicals might be passive might be active they might be radiological or so on. So, here energy in the form of flux which is a mechanical and mechanical energy thermal energy clear because of the movements of the vapor phase and because of the movement of the contaminants everything will get mixed up together. So, in real life what type of situation is prevailing it is very difficult to estimate. Type it on net and uh, check for vapor phase migration. This is a recent subject uh, which is under extensive research by people who are working in the field of geomechanics. How vapor phase migrates in the geomaterials fine. Now, let me ask you a question. 
this situation, I do not know whether you re realize it or not. If I try to compare it with the landfill, what will be the similarity between the one which we have discussed just now and the landfill or there will not be any similarity. And suppose if I say that the landfill happens to be online, it is not an engineered landfill. That means, I have not put any protection system over here in the form of a geo textile, it is an unengineered landfill. Now, in what way this situation and this situation are going to be similar? I hope you understand the context. Very good. So, there could be a situation where the waste which is dumped inside the landfill itself may become chemically active. It need not to be oxidation. Two different elements, hydrocarbons, when they come in contact with something and ambient temperature is let us say very high. In most of the parts of the country that ambient temperature may go to 48, 50 degree very easily during summers, clear? So, what will happen and particularly if I am dumping chemicals here, hydrocarbons which are inflammable, they may catch fire, fine. Now, this is a big hazard for the landfill disposal system, okay. So, please continue. So, suppose there is a temperature over here and you have foundation soil. So, I think two situations are identical, clear? Did you realize this thing? I can do two types of modeling. I can model the space inside the landfill like this or I can model the foundation below the landfill by using this type of model. Got the point? So, what we have discussed is we have talked about how to create models out of the philosophies. So, philosophy was the first, the second is model creation. At last it would be data generation and solving the problem to see what type of influences this type of system would be having on geo environment. Is this part clear? No, it depends upon the flux direction. I just give you a very simple example that how you know one flux and another flux could be in the same direction or could be in a different direction. Now, the question is how are you going to measure the direction of the flux? That is your question actually. Then you have to do instrumentation what he was talking about the other day, Somnath. When you use flux sensors, you use thermocouples, put them at different places in the landfill and at the surface, sub subsurface and observe how heat flux is migrating and how temperatures are changing. So, if I put a thermal flux sensor over here and over here and if I put a thermocouple over here and over here, fine. What I will be getting is flux and temperature theta over a x, y, z domain and time. Now, this is what is known as thermal regime. I will be establishing a thermal regime within the system and you can put a moisture sensor also. I can put a moisture sensor here and here to measure how the moisture is changing over a period of time. Now, this is what actually she is trying to work on. Um, Agnes. The thing I would like to add is uh, this heat generation in landfill can also be due to the degradation by the microorganism onto the waste material. So, that is a source of heat energy and even landfills are considered as a source of geothermal energy. The heat generated can be used for geothermal applications. Correct. So, basically what you are trying to establish is you are trying to establish thermal regime and the moisture profile and the relative humidity. Vapor phase migration is nothing but the relative humidity, clear? So, if I have these four or five parameters, I can do mathematical modeling to understand what type of effects are prevailing in a system which is thermodynamically active. See thermodynamics we never used in geotechnical engineering. I hope you'll, you will agree with me. Now, what we are talking about is we are talking about thermodynamic situation in the soils. It is simple physics you must have studied in your 10 plus 2, Carnot cycle, Carnot engines, heat engines. All right. So, all those things you can use now here. See, all mathematically things. mathematically, and as far as phenomena is concerned, there is no, no change except for one. So, now we are going into much more entry cases, good. Solar heating is always through radiation, clear? So, one of the differences between what you are asking and what I have discussed until now is the mode of migration of heat. So, in this case what I am assuming is everything is through simple advection. 
or if there is a liquid phase existing in this and this, it could be convection. But when you talk about the solar system, the sun transmitting energy over here is all because of radiation. That means the way you will model these situations would change. But ultimately, I am interested in finding out the thermal regime that within the system, how temperature, flux, moisture content and relative humidity changes over a period of time and because of heating, what is happening to the material itself. As she added, you need not to have any heating source from outside. It could be the microbial activity which is trying to decompose everything and hence heat gets generated or for that matter, there could be some explosive which might come in contact with some other material and explode inside the landfill itself. So, these are the different situations which you are supposed to model. And then the question would be once everything has happened inside the landfill, what type of leachers are going to migrate in the geo environment and what type of contamination is going to occur? That is the basic question. So, if I can address to these situations, I can do very easily environmental impact analysis of this type of a situation, clear? And then I can come up with an answer how to contain this type of flow going out by using sensors or by taking out samples and doing ICP analysis or whatever. Is this okay? Anything else which comes to your mind? Yes. Sir, in this case we have discussed whether uh, moisture content is decreasing or uh, increasing with the flux. But if we consider the landfill, uh, the two process may be simultaneous because the leachates may be going down and the gases which are generated in the landfill, they may be moving up. So, it is not that simple case it is going to be a complicated system if we consider L. Very good. Land that is right. That is what actually I wanted to convey. So, somehow in this case I did not talk about the gaseous phase. You can add to that also. Heat flow, fluid flow, fluid flow has two components. One is the gases coming out or sometimes get it, gases may get dissoluted in the pore solution itself. Air or they may come out and the liquid phase migrating downwards. Yes. So, this is the ultimate situation which you are supposed to deal with, correct, you are right. So, it is a very complicated situation, but I am sure for designing a good landfill, you have to keep all these things in mind, otherwise you cannot design a landfill in today's world, fine. Sir, our concern is the soil below the landfill, so how the gas our? will soil actually soil below the landfill, means at the bottom of the landfill, so how the gas will come out from the soil? You have forgotten this case that most of the landfills are located on marine clays or organic clays, fine. And because of the thermal gradient which is getting exposed because of landfill reactions, this system itself may disintegrate so or you never know, the leaches might be giving lot of nutrition for microbial activity to survive here in the foundation of the, of the landfill if things are leaching out. But that is the specific case, but if the landfill is on any laterite soil or something. In the landfill we do not have? If, if the soil does not have any organic matter, so at that time the… See those days are gone when uh, landfills used to be located on the best possible soils. I am sure as a city planner, I will never allow anybody to construct landfill where the foundation depth could be hardly 2 to 3 meters. This is the ideal place for making buildings rather than the landfills. And another issue is the amount of money which I am going to spend in excavating the rock, clear? This thing will not be financially viable when you are going to design landfill over there. So, you are now, you are coupling actually two things. You are talking about the construction practices and the economics of the construction and ultimately how this thing will be guiding landfill design. So, if I am having a very good foundation, I do not think I will be using this space for uh, dumping the waste. Another issue here would be, it is good that you have opened up this issue, how much deep I should be going below the surface or sorry, this is the ground surface or how much high I can stack it over here. There is no point in stacking most of the waste above the ground. Number one thing is, in any civilized society, you will not like to have a heap of waste being stacked except for Delhi where you have, you know, took big heaps of 
MSW and they look like man made mountains, is it not? One is near Ghaziabad, very land famous landfill. So, then I have to go deeper. Now, if I have to go deeper and if I am encountering hard rock over here, cost of excavation, cost of the project will shoot up. So, all these considerations have to be taken into account. The site selection itself is a big question, ok. Above, above ground landfill yes. stack, let us call it as a stack, ok. Then there will be more case of fire, hazard. There will be more case evaluation as compared to when there will more be case of more case evaluation when there will be stack formation because when there will be more case of what sir when there will be decomposition of organic okay matter, then there will be evaluation of gases but when there will be a underground uh, landfill then soil can absorb it more no i don't think this is a correct concept then you should question your philosophy of msw disposal is asking a very interesting question Number one, sorry, just a minute. So, one of the issues is why are you disposing the waste? You want to stack it forever or you want it to disintegrate and get digested? Yeah, uh, landfill top cover will have a gas collection system and then you can flare it up or collect it suitably, or else the, you can even uh, have layers where aero, aeration or uh, the oxidation of the landfill gas can be encouraged, and then this can lead to like uh, if you. Uh, the quant uh, the toxicity of the gas can be reduced. So, top cover itself has inbuilt features which will. Yeah, so, what she is saying is the whole system itself has to be covered later on. This is what is known as post closure. Another thing is, see, the philosophy is not to stack the waste forever. By stacking, we want at least 50 to 70 percent of the waste getting decomposed very quickly so that the volume reduction takes place and I can keep on using this place for further dumping. So, I hope you understand where you can introduce your sensors. You can introduce your sensors below the landfill foundation to see what is leaching out. I would like to insert a sensor over here to see what type of gases are getting formed over here, whether everything is controlled or not. I would not like to allow any gases to come out in the environment. Now, this is what is known as uh, heap leach uh, sensors. That means, in case whenever I create a heap of something and if I want to leach, this is leach, leaching. If I want to detect what is leaching out from here in terms of heavy metals, in terms of liquids, in terms of gases, what are getting present over here, I should be having a sensor which I can simply insert it in the stack and I get all the information what is happening inside and I can control my digestion process. So, these are the examples of coupled phenomena. Another coupled phenomena is where mass migration is occurring. What type of mass migration? Suffusion. I think sometime back we were discussing. This is in fashion these days. I have been dealing with two mega projects in country right now, where one of the consultants from US has taken serious objection on the way the construction was done. And it so happened that a big raft has already collapsed in our own country, causing a lot of damage in terms of money, time and resources. The basic reason of all this happening is below the apron, the raft, you know, the moment they started the weir to function, I hope you understand weir, weir is nothing but a water storage uh, structure. Because of the seepage, all the fines got migrated from the matrix of the soil. Cavities got formed and these cavities ultimately resulted in collapse. We were discussing about the collapse potential in the previous lecture. And because of this cavity formation collapse, the entire system tumbles down. This is a peculiar example of mass transport in geomaterials. Normally, mass transport is talked by uh, chemical engineers. They talk about mass and flux migration through something. No, we normally do not talk about mass migration. We only talk about flux migration heat migration, water migration, water is nothing but hydrostatic flux, electricity migration, charge migration, magnetic field migration and so on. Now, this is a peculiar case where the particles of the soils may migrate from the porous media itself and hence the porosity will not remain constant. Constitutive relationships will change, E is proportional, sorry, sigma is proportional to epsilon is not valid now, why? because the material got changed completely. 
because of migration of fines the material which got created is quite different than the one which was existing earlier. Is this part clear? See the third situation is now this debate is going on saturated versus unsaturated condition in the soil mass. Whatever we have discussed just now because of thermal flux movement of moisture takes place a system which was earlier saturated becomes unsaturated. I always give this analogy how many of you have baked a cake that is the best example you have very good. See the core of the cake always remains more wet as compared to top and bottom. It happens in case of geotechnical engineering also. When you take a pat of soil and then do shrinkage test what happens? You are exposing the system to the environment from the top and the bottom is in touch with the oven clear. So, there is a thermal gradient the top system is having much more evaporation as compared to the bottom and the middle fine. So, the middle portion where the migration of moisture is extremely less remains wet. So, soft portion of the cake is always in the middle of the cake the top crust is very thick and the bottom is also quite thick. Now, this type of situation occurs every day in geomaterials. This is how we define OC and NC behavior by the way I do not know whether you have given a serious thought or not. A OC NC behavior is exactly same to this phenomena. Go to the coastal areas the top 2 to 3 feet of the soil is baked by the sunlight or sun you are talking about that clear becomes very stiff the bottom portion remains soft. By any chance if you create an embankment on the top of the soil you know what is going to happen OC materials are very dangerous they will ultimately result in collapse. I can negotiate with NC response, but I cannot negotiate with OC response. So, I will prefer laying foundations for embankments on NC material rather than OC material. The same is the case for the foundations also. Got the point? So, presently the debate is going on between saturated versus unsaturated state of the material. The first thing is what causes unsaturated state of the material to develop. In the previous lecture you were talking about you know plants and their roots sucking all the moisture and we were talking about you know uh, slopes remaining stable because of suction which gets generated in the soils. It helps you clear reverse the situation the type of landfill which you are talking about the forging units which you might be having at the basement of the buildings or in case of any let us say furnaces or the foundation of furnaces which are sitting on the natural deposits what is going to happen the heat migration occurs soil mass loses its moisture and because of loss of moisture from the soil mass there could be a collapse. So, suction may be very useful for you and sometimes suction may not be so useful for you. You got this point depends upon the situation and the type of material you are dealing with. So, this has become a very big issue in today's uh, contemporary geotechnical engineering and I am sure you must have realized that there are a lot of people who have started working in the field of unsaturated soils we are one of them and our now the best possible equipment has also come in our laboratory next time when you come to do this suction measurement environmental uh, geotech sorry not environmental experimental geotechnics experiment that time I can show you by that time it will be fully commissioned uh, you can talk about now the shear strength compressibility consolidation of unsaturated state of the material which is quite new uh, it is not very common. The another thing is we assume that cation exchange capacity of the material is insignificant which is not true earlier lectures I think some of you had given this hint that uh, soils are used for washing hands and you know clothes and some not clothes in fact some utensils and so on. One of the reasons is that the particles of the soils are negatively charged and they have a very good capacity to exchange cations which exist on the top of them with the environment you do not require soap fine. So, the cleansing effect which soils give you is next to nothing particularly we gave a logic about your face packs and the 
you know the monmonide which is used for uh, facials and skin treatment and so on. Why it is so? Because the cation exchange capacity which is nothing but the activity of the soil. In conventional geomechanics we always talk about sensitivity and we have de defined activity also capacity index divided by less than 2 percent sorry less than 2 micron percentage clay basically. Unfortunately, this definition is not correct because you are not taking into account the activity of the minerals. So, if you want to take activity of the mineral in account then you have to be talking about cation exchange capacity of the soils and this parameter makes soil what it is. So, later on you will realize that if you are dealing with clays their CEC is going to be very high sands CEC is extremely low clear. So, from our group lot of people have worked in this area create a new classification scheme for soils based on CEC only. You need not to follow this protocol of testing the soils for so many days. You just do a simple test get the CEC of the soil and you know what type of category this soil will belong to. Is this okay? So, this has become a very interesting parameter which defines the activity of the soil with respect to environment. Is this okay? Hygroscopic moisture content is a good example of CEC. Soils getting polluted because of the disposal of industrial waste having a lot of chemical species is a good example of how CEC helps in holding the cations which are present in the environment onto the soil surface. So, the topic on which we were working some time back is soil contaminant interaction. My philosophy was when two friends meet what do they do? They shake hands, they say hello hi is it not? So, my idea was that how soils interact with environment can be quantified. One of my students did this work by Dr. Srinivas. We realized that CEC is a parameter which is a black box. It contains everything into it. It contains physics of the material, surface area, specific gravity. It contains the chemistry of the material in terms of what type of oxides are present their composition and it contains the mineralogy also. That means, physical chemical mineralogical aspects are embedded in cation exchange capacity. So, today's geomechanics particularly when we talk about environmental geomechanics for environmental applications, we do not talk about liquid limit, plastic limit and particle size and all those things it is becoming obsolete. The best parameter would be check the cation exchange capacity and find out how reactive the material is towards environment. A very low cation exchange capacity shows system is dormant clear. A very high CEC value indicates system is highly reactive, active, sensitive and so on clear. There are some protocols by which you can find out CEC very easily. So, CEC has become a very interesting parameter which is not included anywhere in geomechanics. In this context suppose if I give you an example, what is the difference between when we say sand fraction, clay fraction, silt fraction, what is that you are connoting to? Is my question clear? You do PSD is it not particle size distribution curve and you try to say that the soil has less than 2 micron clay fraction is this, silt fraction is this, sand fraction is this, medium sand is so much. What is the meaning of this? See truly speaking it has no meaning. Please wake up and try to understand what I am saying. Truly speaking this size fraction has no meaning, no significance. Why? When you say less than 2 micron is clay fraction, please remember we always say clay sized fraction. It is a very deceptive term. Mineralogy is not changing. I may take a big boulder and I may start breaking it clear. So, from boulder I may bring it down to pebbles, cobbles, stones further breaking will bring it down to coarse sand, fine sand keep on crushing it. What will happen in a crusher? From fine sand it will come down to silt size. Still I crush it silt to fine silt 
and if you still crush it what will happen? It will be following less than 2 micron. So, your glass furnace slag, blast furnace slag we are grinding it so much that everything becomes in micron range. What has happened? The chemical mineralogical constituents of the material are same. Did you realize this? So, PSD in today's world has become a very spurious term, it has no significance, it, it, it does not contribute to anything because there could be a situation when I take active minerals and I start grinding them though they are very very small clear or I may try to form a big ball out of the clay minerals. So, I am increasing the particle size of the particles just by interlacing them with some chemicals or with water or whatever. So, size is a physical phenomena nothing more than that, but what makes it very active or inactive is the chemical composition which is directly or indirectly influencing the mineralogical phases which are present in the system. So, the uh, mineralogy of the for a boulder and uh, if we grind it to a micron uh, micron size particles that remains same, but uh, how much minerals are exposed to environment or in any chemical what it will react with that is different because when it is in a boulder size then that, that uh, wait for some time I think you should not have this type of wrong notions in your mind wait hold on for some time when we talk about diffusion process then your answer will be you know uh, very clear to you sorry this questions answer you will be getting. So, please hold on for some time do not have this type of notation that when you grind something uh, you know minerals are getting exposed it is not like that. Yes, what you wanted to say maybe is when you grind something the surface area increases when you are using a wrong word clear listen 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 you, you have ideas, but you somehow you are not putting them in the right words. So, surface area is increasing because of the particle size correct activity is getting induced because of the surface area not because of mineralogy. So, it is a beautiful example of mineralogy remaining constant simply crushing the particles and making them very small would increase the activity of the particle because of physical phenomena which happens to be surface area enhancement you got the point. Why do you take everything in a powder form pills mostly medicines why? Why do not you take them in solid form as you rightly said. So, the moment you grind it each particle is contributing surface area has become too high the smaller the particle size more the surface area per unit gram clear. So, this is the very important thing now when you talk about the interaction of the soils with the environment it may so happen that the surface which comes in contact with the environment first there this logic is correct, but what happens when after the first interaction has occurred at the surface this chemical must be having a tendency to penetrate through the particle itself. Now, this is what is known as endo diffusion this will be discussing later on all right. Now, this is where the mineralogy comes in the picture. So, the question is that unless you unless you do justice with the material unless you really talk about the cation exchange capacity you are not defining the material clearly. Another major issue is we do not talk about the biochemical degradation of the geomaterials particularly of the organic soils due to prolonged exposure to man made environment. Now, this is a very important issue and I hope you understand several times we have talked about this clear. So, in short the assumptions which you have made are quite critical. So, the issue is that what you are studying in term in the realm of conventional geotechnical engineering is not addressing the main issues which are associated with the material fine and unless you understand the material you will not be able to understand its response to different stimuli is this part clear. Now, if you can you are convinced with the statement then what should be following what you should be doing next if you are convinced with all this you should be trying to understand the material in the best possible manner and this is where the importance of characterization of material becomes very high. So, in modern day geotechnical engineering most of us are doing 
material characterization. Fortunately, we have the tools which can allow you to see into the material up to angstrom level or nano level or I do not know up to what level. So, all these equipments courtesy electronics and communications and you know modern day MEMS, NEMS has really given us the tools we can see through the material in the most precise manner. So, this is what now we will be dis starting discussing. Is this okay? Then the question is the classification scheme which you have been studying until now whether they are of any relevance or not. How many types of soil classification scheme you have come across? How many types of classification schemes for soils you have come across? Uh, UC, USCS is the that comes much later. Please always start from the beginning you know you should follow the hierarchy the way things got evolved. Uh, my simple question is what different types of soil classification schemes you have come across? Uh, well graded travel that will come much later. Please go back to the genesis of the soil because we have you have studied the soil classification based on the process of formation, deposition, transportation. These are three classification schemes. Please do not forget. Yes, you are right. So, the first the mo foremost classification is residual transported clear. Second one comes the way the deposit has been formed you say airlin, alluvial you know what not fat clay, humus, valved clays, marine deposits and so on. Then after that then comes your physical characterization. So, what type of physical characterization you are doing? Texture, particle size, then comes your interaction with water at above limits. It is a classification scheme. How much sensitive a material is towards environment in the purest form, no harm, clear. So, you are allowing soil to interact with water to obtain its liquid limit, plastic limit, shrinkage limit and flow index and all those things which you come across. It is a classification scheme. Then comes what? Having done atabug limits, it is all included. All this is included in atabug limits. Then comes your compaction process. Based on compaction and the shape of the curve, you classify the soils. Remember not. Just by looking at the graph, you can say, oh, this is this material, this cannot be this material. Why? You have a beautiful bell shaped curve, it is understood, it is a silty soil. A flat curve, you know, it is a clay material. But you are not happy with so many classifications, then what did you do? You classified soil further by looking at their response in terms of chemistry, somehow has not come in classical geomechanics except for a little bit of mineralogy. Then, as an engineer, what we did? We started talking about consolidation characteristics and based on the CC, CV parameters, we started classifying the soils. See, this is the whole philosophy, you know. These numbers are nothing but classification schemes. So, the moment you say CC is 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, nothing is going to happen, lay the foundation here, no settlements, clear. The moment CC crosses 0 0.8, 0 0.9, greater than 1, you have to be careful. Why? You have classified the material in two ways, dangerous, non-dangerous, safe and like this, clear? What else you did? You never not happy with this even, then came shear strength, correct? See, this is how the geomechanics is taught to you in discrete terms. Truly speaking, this is nothing but the evolution of classification of the system. So, what, what shear strength is? response of the material against external loading. Because whatever schemes we discussed until now, it never considered the external forces acting on it and how system is going to behave except for consolidation. So, then people came up with the idea of shear strength. If I shear the material, what will be the response of the material? And based on this C and phi, they started defining the material in two groups, cohesive, non-cohesive. 
that also disappeared the moment the history of <coughs> formation of soil came into picture that day we were discussing if you remember your dense sands and OC and and, and uh, stiff clays they show you same response. So, everything vanished and then we use only two classification schemes OC or NC nothing else this is how the whole system is is this clear followed good. Now, the question is whether all this is acceptable or not are you happy with this. So, the present day scenario is like this the parameters which we consider are grain size distribution, soil consistency, liquid limit, plastic limit, plasticity index, but I am sure you must have realized that are you happy with this or you think that is incomplete. It is just like seeing a patient only physically, doctor has not touched the patient, no test has been done, your only particle size is you are just seeing we discussed so much about the particle size and its in limitations in defining the material characteristics you remember mineralogy does not get reflected over here. So, what should be done is something like this. Now, this is quite futuristic we should be talking about not PSD we should be talking about the size of the grains which are passing through 200 micron sieve see sorry number sieve not micron micron will be what 200 micron 2 micron <laughs> why clay particle this portion has never been considered very conveniently we said Stokes law is not valid hydrometer is not valid then if it is not valid then it is your problem is it not see material has not been understood clearly a specific surface has not been considered at all. Now, a specific surface is what we have been pitching all the time is the total surface of the particle which you were talking about getting exposed to the environment it is a very good concept actually you have the basic concept it requires a bit of refinement we will talk about this later. So, the surface area which is exposed to the environment per unit gram of the soil is known as a specific surface area. A beautiful characterization scheme has been developed by one of my PhD scholars Dr. Paresh Shah, where we have used surface area itself to define and differentiate between different soils clear this was a new classification scheme. Then comes the pore fluid characteristics sometime back we were discussing about this issue that the first thing doctors tell you when you go, when you go to a polyclinic is get your blood test done and bring the report then I will discuss with you this is correct. The same thing we do as a professional we are not bothered about the particle size wise nothing the first thing is take some soil soak it in water take out the solution test that that tells you what is the main disease what the material is pore solution chemistry pore solution chemistry has become a very important tool in our subject earlier this used to be the domain of agricultural scientists, but I am sure most of the sensing techniques are dependent upon pore solution chemistry. Either you take out a soil sample ok X C 2 take it to the lab dissolve it in a solution filter the solution and then test all the attributes pH electrical conductivity total dissolved solids clear degree of contamination in terms of different type of metals which it might be having or do in situ by putting a sensor and this sensor tells you what is the pH, what is the E C, what is the gas content and so on. Ultimately the calib calibration of the sensor has to be done based on the analysis of the samples which you are doing. So, pore solution has become a very important parameter. Ion exchange capacity is also uh, nothing but cation exchange capacity. Most of the interaction processes which occur between soils and the environment are dependent upon how easily cations can be exchanged by the soil from the outer world. In other words, how easily the soils will become contaminated. Different species of heavy metals they might come and sit on the surface of the soil fine if cation exchange capacity is more yes mineralogically it is very active surface area is very high the chances of external heavy metals getting parked on this are very high. I always give a logic you know you have a parking lot which is completely em empty you drive in you can park it anywhere. The problem is once the parking lot gets filled up 
most of the cars go back. Same thing happens in case of soils also. There is a surface on which most of the activity is going to happen. Heavy metals come and get parked. Now there is no place for the next heavy metal particle or heavy metal to come and sit over here. It may get rejected. There could be a selective, selective treatment also. The metal, the, the, the soil particle may like to have or may have affinity towards certain heavy metal, say for that matter high, high valency, clear. A high valent ion is going to sit on the surface of the clay easily as compared to a low valent ion. So, this type of competitive selective sorption process happens. We will discuss all this later on, this is too much of you know micro phenomena which we are going to talk about subsequently. So, because of the CEC, the sorption characteristics of the materials become high. So, if you want to define this activity of the material, the sorption properties have to be defined. How easily the cations from the environment will get parked on the surface of the particle. Sir, till now we actually talking about in geotechnical engineering, we normally talk about foundation design. If we design a foundation and the foundation is based on the shear strength or bearing capacity. But after seeing this type of uh, these new topics, now we have to change our mind. Because uh, if only we do a foundation based on the bearing capacity or settlement criteria, that it may, it may fail. So, a uh, little bit excited and uh, I think lots of things should be, uh, should we know right now after this. Sir, uh, you are telling that, that nowadays particle size distribution is irrelevant. irrelevant. But I am not agree with that because uh, nowadays uh, when we got some sample, first thing we do is uh, what is the uh, particle size present in the soil. So I think, uh, yeah, I agree with you, but I need uh, more time to study and to grab it. Okay, let me quickly complete the other two issues which are, which have not been discussed much in conventional geotechnical engineering. The first is electrical properties. Now, most of the sensing devices these days which are being used and I am sure that all of you will agree with me that nowadays geotechnical engineering is mostly on uh, you know sensing techniques, is it not? We use GPR, we use probes, we use moisture probes, contaminant probes, uh, geophysical survey we do, is it not? So, most of these techniques are based on electronics or electrical impulse or the pulse which goes into the geomaterials. What it means is even if electromagnetic waves are traveling in the porous media, soils, rocks, groundwater, clear? The properties of the system which are known as electrical properties become very, very important. So, there is a new school of thought which says that let us characterize soils based on their dielectric response. All of you have studied dielectric response in your 10 plus 2 physics capacitors, how current passes through it. Did you ever do telediscus paper test for finding out the discharge through a body of the dam or foundations? Normally they give you this exercise during undergraduate, is it not? Conducting paper, you scale down the entire dam cross section, you must have done, you have done? Yes, seepage line. So, how would you draw seepage lines? You take a conducting paper which is known as telediscus paper. It is on one side of the paper you coat silver and the other side remains uh, non-conducting. You scale down the entire hydraulic structure, say 1 is to 1000, 10000 and create a miniature on the paper and then you can draw flow nets. By using simple electric potential you apply on two sides, upstream, downstream and then you can draw the flow lines and all. You have done it or not? Another good example is copper sulphate solution if you take and then pass the current through that. So, people have been like winner's arrangement, people have used Schlumberger test which people have done. We have been utilizing this concepts of electrical properties in soils, of soils, but we never elaborated it so much. Nowadays, because of the sensing techniques and so many probes which have come in the market, people have started thinking of 
soil as a lossy capacitor and the beauty of capacitor is it stores everything charge soils stores water and air and contaminants porous system lot of similarity between capacitors the electric material and the soil itself the best possible aquifers store water in a porous matrix clear so these are the logics which are coming you know forwards so conductivity and dielectric constant of the material has become a very big way to understand how electromagnetic waves will pass through the soils and based on the response of the material you can characterize it clays will have a totally different response sands will have totally different response rocks will have totally different response response saturated and unsaturated state of the material will have a totally different response and so on as as what was the student who worked with me and we devised a methodology to find out how ac current migrates through the geomaterials we have proposed a lot of philosophies there we have published it a lot so electrical properties have become very interesting people are trying to work on this similarly thermal properties have become very very useful and somnath's whole thesis you have gone through he is trying to characterize soils based on how heat migrates through the material what we were discussing or what is the response of the geomaterial when it is when the stimuli happens to be heat flux so most of the sensors which work on the thermal response of the material like a thermometer is a sensor for this to understand you should understand how heat migration take, takes place through geomaterials and when we talk about heat migration the three terms which are very important are thermal diffusivity thermal resistivity and thermal heat capacity this list can grow more and more and more i haven't included here anything related to microbiology is it not which i am i have started learning now so that will come over here so microbial concentration and how microbial concentration influences the different type of soils the difference in the materials based on its microbial count that's a good way to differentiate between two types of soils just by counting the microbial activity into it it's a very futuristic subject